Hello everyone and welcome to the latest of Field Fisher's Privacy webinar series. Today we're covering a, covering a data protection review of the year 2020. My name is Hazel Grant, I'm the Head of Data Privacy and I'm based in our London office. Thank you for joining us. I'm joined by my fellow partners from our London office and in a few moments I'm going to ask them each to introduce themselves as they present their section of today's session. But first of all, I'd like to explain how we plan today's session. It's not at all scientific, rather it's the product of some brainstorming. We were on a call and we just decided to pick our favorite topics or perhaps the most influential topic of the year. So what we're going to cover is enforcement, Brexit, no webinar is complete without Brexit, CCPA, SHREMS 2, and the new standard contractual clauses. I'm going to ask each of my colleagues to speak for around 10 minutes because we have quite a lot to get through and we'll also have some time for questions at the end. For those of you who don't already know us, Field Fisher is an international law firm with offices across Europe in Silicon Valley and in China and our privacy team works across all of those offices. We are a collaborative team providing strategic and actionable privacy solutions and I know you're going to hear about that during our webinar. Turning to housekeeping, please do ask us questions using the question function on your screen. We've got some time at the end for questions and if we don't manage to get through them all, we will get back to you after the session. We aim to finish at 3 p.m. UK today. Later today, we're going to send you all, oh, sorry, not later today, maybe, maybe later this week, we will send you a copy of the slides and also a recording. So don't feel that you have to scribble everything down as we go along. A couple of other points before we kick off, please do subscribe to our blog and keep an eye out for more webinars at the start of 2021. If you would like to take the Field Fisher Get Data Protection Fit course, subscribe on our YouTube channel and you'll find details when we send the follow up email after today. So it's down to me um, to make a start. You can see there our agenda. Um, but I'm going to cover DPA fines, so let me kick off with that. Every lawyer's favourite topic. So let's turn to the first substantive slide. DPA fines, is that it? Is that all you really need to think about? Well, I suppose it sounds a bit weird to start on a session talking about fines to say, no, it's not it. You do have to think about other things. But given the constraints of time, I'm going to have to cram what I want to say into a few minutes, so I'm going to concentrate on UK fines. But please don't forget fines elsewhere in the world, fines across the EU. We're seeing some significant numbers there. And please also don't forget group litigation continues. It seems almost inexorable. We will see the development of group litigation. And when we see relatively small amounts for large numbers of individuals, that will add up significantly. So you might well find that your fears of an ICO fine of several million pounds, it's actually, you should put those to one side and have your fears for group litigation. Anyway, enough of what it's not, let's talk about the next slide. So one of my fellow panelists suggested that I put this on a graph, which I did attempt to do, but I'm afraid my maths just wouldn't work. Because if you look at the bottom line there, where I have totaled up the GDPR fines from the ICO, I could not find a scale which would take me from nothing to £275,000 to £39 million and have a meaningful graph on, on, on this slide. What I have done is just calculated up the GDPR fines as opposed to anything else. If you look at what the ICO is finding, it finds quite significantly in direct marketing. Um, but here I've just looked at GDPR fines and we can see nothing in 2018. Admittedly, it was a part year. We had to wait for the GDPR to come into effect. Um, really very little in 2019, just the doorstep dispensary with £275,000. And then, wow, look at 2020. We are at 39.65 million already. So I think we're unlikely to see more at the end of this year, but you know, there are a few days left. The ICO could be holding a special surprise out there somewhere. But 
it's quite a significant change in how fines are being levied now. And I would say it's not um, isolated only to the UK, it does exist elsewhere. So you'll notice a theme. I, I noticed that some of my fellow speakers have, um, have been looking at TV programmes and TV games. I couldn't resist this one, which is a real blast from the past. I, I expect nobody will remember Brucey's The Price is Right. But I, <laughs> oh dear, Phil does. Um, I thought it, it might be apt for looking at how the BA and Marriott fines have changed. I mean, they started at super significant numbers. 183 million down to 20 million for BA. Marriott, 99 million down to 18.4 million. Really significant changes. What would I say the learning points are from this? Well, I suppose a learning point that's there that um, uh, that you you really do need to think about is um, we have had some leniency, um, but don't assume this amount of leniency outside a pandemic. Although the, if you look at the figures, the reductions were, say, 4 million for BA due to COVID. That's um, a significant amount of anybody's money. But the really big reduction is from 80, 183 down to 20 million. So where did that come from? I think some of the things that that came from was um, potentially a change in approach by the ICO where they had used some draft internal guidance <laughs> for some of their original calculations. And then they revise that when they got to the final fines. So learning point from the ICO, perhaps have firmer guidance to use as the basis for fining. Learning point for the rest of us, don't assume that there will be millions of pounds worth of reductions outside a pandemic. A final learning point, there is an exponential growth in fines. We can expect more. It won't be limited to the UK. We are going to see this across uh, Europe as well, and we are seeing it. So significant fines on their way, real reasons to invest in compliance. So I'm going to finish there and hand over to Phil, who is going to take us to our next topic, which is Brexit. Thank you very much, Hazel. Um, <clears throat> so I'm delighted to be here today. And just to introduce myself briefly for anybody who doesn't know me, uh, my name is Phil Lee. I'm a partner in our London-based privacy team. And it seems that, like Hazel, I share a common interest in trashy television. Um, so I am here today to talk to you about Brexit. Now, Hazel sent me the somewhat unenviable task of trying to still down four years of Brexit negotiations, which were uh, unraveling the previous 40 years of UK and EU integration. Uh, in the space of 10 minutes. So I'm going to see if I can achieve what our trade negotiators have so far failed to do. If we just start off with a brief recap, um, you know, you will no doubt uh, already be aware that the Brexit referendum on the 23rd of June 2016 resulted in a vote where 52% of the UK voted to leave the EU. You flash, flash forward a few years to the 31st of January this year and the UK left the EU at 11 p.m. UK time, midnight Central European time. Uh, and from that point, the UK was no longer in the EU. However, notwithstanding that we'd left the EU, we remained subject to a withdrawal agreement, which effectively continued to apply European Union law in the UK until the 31st of December this year. So we are now in our final month of this kind of transition period. And we are uh, scheduled to have EU law cease to apply to us as at, uh, as at the end of this year. Now, I, I was quite anxious coming into this presentation because right now there are sort of developments breaking as we speak. Um, we, we know that currently the UK EU trade negotiators are working around the clock to try and get a final trade deal agreed between the UK and the EU. We're down to a few final sticking points around sort of fishing rights, and governance and the level playing field. And it is being referred to by commentators as the last roll of the, uh, last roll of the dice for achieving a trade deal. So, you know, li literally, if you follow the news hour by hour, day by day, we may see announcements very shortly, one way or the other. Um, why, why is this week so important in particular? Basically, because any deal that we achieve with the EU would need to be ratified by the European Parliament before the end of the year. And that process takes time. So we are already at the 8th of December. 
we have until the 31st of December for something to be done. Now, the inevitable question is what this all means for data protection law and what happens to data protection in the UK when the transition period ends. Well, you know, without without um, uh, any mechanism to save uh, sort of the GDPR into UK law, the the essential effect would be that the GDPR would no longer apply to the UK. What happens though is we have this uh, legislative instrument in the UK called the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018, which comes to the rescue. And the effect of that legislation is basically to save the GDPR into UK domestic law. And by doing so, what we effectively do is copy and paste the EU GDPR into the UK and recall it the UK GDPR. So effectively, we get a mirroring of the GDPR into UK domestic law. And the, the EU Withdrawal Act also has the same effect on the privacy and electronic communications regulations. That's the UK's implementation of the e-privacy directive for those who, of you who are familiar with it. And also, of course, we have our own domestic Data Protection Act 2018, which works hand in hand with the GDPR. And so effectively, the law as it exists before the end of the year will more or less continue to apply on a very similar basis after the end of the year, albeit that it will now be EU law that is retained in the UK as UK domestic legislation. Now, if you're really on the board, you may also be thinking to yourself, well, how exactly does that work? Because the, the GDPR, if you read through it, there are various bits about, you know, lead authorities and one-stop shops and the operation of the European Data Protection Board, all of which are concepts that will have no real meaning in the UK when we sit, uh, when, you know, uh, once we are outside of the scope of EU law. And this is where we have another piece of legislation that comes into uh, into save the day, the sort of rather snappily titled Data Protection, Privacy and Electronic Communications Amendments, etc., EU Exit Regulations 2020, or if you prefer something a bit shorter, the Exit Regulations. And the way I like to think of this as a piece of law is essentially to be like a kind of global find and replace on words. So, you know, if you've got a big word document and you need to kind of change a definition within it, you sort of hit control F and you find all instances of, of that, that word and you just do an automatic replace. It's a little bit similar. That's kind of what the EU exit, exit regulations do. They essentially scan through all of the um, law that we are retaining into, into UK data protection legislation and they tweak it to make any of those references to the very specific um, EU references work in the UK. So references to the EDPB or, or to European Data Protection Authorities will be amended to refer to, for example, the Information Commissioner's Office or the Secretary of State or whatever the relevant bodies happen to be. We can move on to the next slide, please. Now, Probably the biggest topic that people are concerned about is what Brexit means for data flows between the UK and the EU. And broadly speaking, what you can do here is kind of characterize um, the, the impact of Brexit on data flows under three headings. Data that's moving from the UK to the EU, data that is moving from the EU to the UK, and data that is moving from the UK or the EU to the rest of the world, to other countries that are not in the EU, and they're not the UK. If we take them one by one and start with data flows that are moving from the UK to the EU, the short answer at the moment is that they remain unaffected for the time being. The intention is that UK data, data that is subject to the UK GDPR, will still be able to flow freely from the UK to EU member states. And that's effectively because the UK will grant adequacy, UK adequacy to all EU member states. In terms of data flows from the EU to the UK, this is the big unknown at the moment. What essentially, once the UK ceases to be subject to UK law, we become like any other third country, you know, similar to the US or any other country that is outside of the EU. If we get adequacy given to us by the um, uh, by the European Commission, in other words, if we're deemed a safe place to receive EU data then data can continue to flow freely from the EU to the UK. If, however, we don't get that adequacy determination, then just like any other EU country, there will need to be a mechanism 
uh, in, uh, put in place between the EU data exporter and the UK data importer in order to enable that data to move between the two regions. So that would be something like standard contractual clauses. But that mechanism is also going to need to be Schrems 2 proof, uh, which is a topic on which uh, my partner Renzo is going to speak to you about a little bit later on. As for data flows from the UK or the EU to the rest of the world, at the moment it's very much business as usual. The, you know, when data is moving from either of these regions to, to a non-UK, non-EU region, the normal GDPR rules will apply. You will either need to transfer to a country that has got adequacy or where you have appropriate safeguards like standard contractual clauses in place or where you can rely on a data export derogation. Next slide, please. So just looking at some of the other consequences of Brexit, uh, one of the big concerns really is around, you know, perhaps what we would call double jeopardy, a kind of duplicating of rules between the EU GDPR and the UK GDPR. Now this in part arises because the UK um, not being part of the EU will no longer fall within the scope of the EU GDPR one-stop shop. So at the moment, if you are an organization that is treating the UK as your lead authority in Europe and therefore benefiting from one-stop shop arrangements, that will no longer apply after the end of this year. So in effect, what that means is that if you are a business that is subject to both the EU GDPR and the UK GDPR, maybe because you're established in both regions or because you are selling into both regions or monitoring data subjects in both regions, then the result is you are going to be subject both to UK and EU regulators' jurisdictions. That means, for example, that if you have a data breach that affects UK and EU data subjects, that breach will need to be reported twice in both regions. If you currently have an EU DPO, you may also need to appoint a UK data protection officer as well. It could be the same person, but you might decide to appoint someone different. Equally, if you are not uh, uh, if you don't have an establishment in the UK or the EU, then you may need to appoint an Article 27 representative, not to be confused with the DPO, it's something different, um, but essentially a representative is like a local post box that serves as a point of contact for data protection authorities in the region. But there, there is a requirement that already exists under the GDPR for uh, entities that are outside of the EU. That requirement will be mirrored into the UK as well, meaning you may need a representative in both regions. And if you are a BCR holder, if you've, if you've achieved BCRs and had that approved, then it will also have an impact on you too. If your BCR was approved in the UK, that BCR will now need to find a new lead authority who can um, serve as the, the primary authority for your BCR in the EU. Equally, if your BCR was approved in the EU, then you will now need to apply for UK BCRs if you intend to rely on your BCR to export data from the UK. So if we can just move on to the next slide. In practical terms, then, what that means is you need to start off by assessing if you are subject to the UK GDPR, the EU GDPR, or in all likelihood, both, um, both pieces of legislation. Again, that's a question of determining whether you're established in those regions or if you're not established in them, looking at whether you sell into them or whether you monitor individuals within those regions. If you have, uh, if you were relying on the UK as your lead authority currently, then you need to identify after the end of the year whether you can find another country that can serve as your EU lead authority under the EU GDPR, assuming you're still subject to the EU GDPR. You will also need to look at the data flows moving in and around your business. In other words, how are you transferring data between your group companies and where are you transferring data externally to either vendors or to partners? And that's gonna be especially important for data flows from the EU countries into the UK. Because as we saw earlier, if the UK does not get adequacy, then as the next bullet indicates, you will need to make sure you have a lawful mechanism in place to continue to enable any EU to UK flows of data. Next up, you will need to think about your data breach reporting procedures. Again, you know, if you are currently thinking about reporting breaches only in the EU, you may need to consider now whether those breaches also need to be reported separately in the UK. And you also need to look at whether you are going to need a UK DPO and or a UK representative 
again, in light of the fact that essentially those requirements are going to be mirrored from the EU GDPR into UK domestic law. And as we touched upon on the previous slide, if you are an existing BCR holder, think about whether you need to refile your BCRs in either the UK or the EU. That's a quick summary of some of the practical things you will need to think through. And with that, I think I'm just about there in 10 minutes. So I'm now going to hand over to my partner, Judy, who is going to talk to you about the globalization of data protection law. Judy, over to you. Thanks, Phil. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Judy Krieg, and I'm also a partner in the privacy team in London, notwithstanding the American accent. Uh, so originally, we were going to talk about the CCPA in this section, but in thinking about the year in review and what's happened in 2020, I thought it was more appropriate to talk about how has the GDPR been globalized in 2020? Because um, I have to tell you, one of the most common requests that we get from clients is, okay, I'm already doing everything to a GDPR standard. GDPR is supposed to be the global standard for data protection in the world. I want to do global forms. I want one program that's going to cover all of my data processing worldwide. And as we're all doing a lot more of electronic data processing, our data is more global. So isn't it enough that I'm doing a GDPR data processing system? And the answer, short answer, unfortunately, is no. But what we are seeing is that the GDPR is being incorporated into other countries' laws. So we want to spend just a few minutes talking about in 2020 how that's happened with a particular focus on the CCPA. So as you can see here, we saw some new, uh, if we can go back to the last slide, we saw some new what I'll call GDPR-ish data laws coming into effect. And we're not going to talk uh, in detail about Argentina or Brazil, um, but obviously people refer to those as the Brazil GDPR or the Argentinian GDPR. And you may have heard about the CCPA, um, California Consumer Privacy Act in California, which is being referred to as in some circles as the US GDPR. But the question is, is this really the case? I mean, we know the GDPR has extraterritorial aspects to it, but are other countries adopting the GDPR in the same way that we've adopted the GDPR? Next slide. And I know we're throwing a lot of TV shows at you, but I think the best way to look at how other countries are localizing the GDPR in their own laws is to look at a yet a different TV show, and this one is The Office. Now, unlike The Price is Right or Jeopardy, which were actually U.S. game shows to start, believe it or not, The Office was originally a British show starring Ricky, uh, Ricky Gervais. It was then exported to the US and starred Stephen Carell. And the reason why I think this is a good example of how other countries are incorporating the GDPR is that when the office came to the US, it was adapted to the US market. And while there were aspects of the British show that were taken on board, it became its own show with its own characters and its own themes. So while there's some relationship and some similarities between the UK version, it really is a separate TV show on its own merits and has some similar aspects, but really is quite different. And that's how I think you should think of how the CCPA has globalized or taken on board the GDPR. Next slide. So even though there's a real temptation to just think of the CCPA as being a GDPR with an American accent, the California Attorney General, who is responsible for enforcing the CCPA, has been very, very clear that the CCPA is not just a US version of the GDPR. It is different. And when you're dealing with how to, how, to, how to align the CCPA with your GDPR program, there's a few things that we wanted to say where things are similar, where the, where the US has actually imported the, the GDPR concepts almost lock, stock and barrel. The first one is in the notion of personal information under the CCPA really does follow the GDPR notion of personal data. And this is actually quite different for the US. Other US laws, and in fact, California laws, already have the concepts of PII, personal identity information, or personal identification information, or PHI if you're dealing with um, healthcare laws. And those are more narrow in terms of what they prescribe as, as, as data that is, that is governed by the data privacy laws. 
we all know that personal data under the GDPR is a very broad concept and includes things like cookies and IP addresses and things that you would never be able to guess someone's name from. And that is a pretty new concept in U.S. law that the CCPA has brought to the U.S. shores and it's taken almost lock, stock and barrel from the GDPR. So when you look at how the U.S. and the CCPA is adopting the GDPR in that respect, they're almost exactly the same. Uh, the GDPR is different, however, in that um, it does a, it, it is a law of general application. It applies across all industries and all sectors, as does the CCPA. And that's actually something quite different in the U.S. Up until the CCPA, most of the privacy laws in the U.S. are sector or industry specific. So to have a law that tries to cover across all situations, um, all types of data processing, um, is something that's relatively new in the U.S. and that the CCPA, again, has adopted lock, stock, and barrel from the GDPR. Next slide. Where the CCPA is very different from the GDPR, and this is, again, the most common question we get under the CCPA and one that Phil particularly asked me to include here, is that people think that because it looks like the GDPR, the notion of a GDPR data controller reads directly across to a CCPA business and a GDPR data processor reads directly across to a CCPA service provider. And that simply is not the case. So this is a good example of where you can't just use your GDPR concepts to assume that the data privacy law in the US, the CCPA is gonna apply those concepts the same way. A service provider under the CCPA, because of the way the CCPA is written, is not always a data processor under GDPR. Sometimes a service provider under the CCPA can be doing things with data that would otherwise be considered a data controller function under the GDPR, specifically where service providers can use personal data, personal information for their own use, for product enhancement or for analytics. What we typically think of in GDPR as being a data controller aspect, but under the CCPA, because of the way the regulations are written, that's something a service provider can do. And that's very important when you're thinking about CCPA and whether somebody is acting as your service provider or not, and whether or not you're selling personal information to them or not. Now, we're not here to get into a long detailed discussion of the CCPA and the GDPR, but the point that we wanted to leave you with is that even though people think of the CCPA as being just an American version of the GDPR, there are some very key differences. And so while the concepts may be similar, you have to be very careful not to just read across what you already know under the GDPR under the CCPA. Next slide. So again, coming back to conclusion, how the U.S. has globalized the GDPR is not the same as how we're using the GDPR, just as how they've, they've enacted, how they've taken the Office TV show and made it their own. And actually, believe it or not, these are snippets of all other countries in the U.S. that have adopted some version of the TV show, The Office, um, including, including Sweden, Finland, and um, some EU countries. So the, the key point that we wanna leave you with is that the GDPR is being globalized. It is being adopted, or at least concepts that are GDPR concepts are being adopted in local country laws. Um, but there are local country variations. So while we're not yet at a place where we can have just a GDPR program manage all of your international data compliance, we are moving in that direction. Now there is an area where the GDPR is imposing a standard that is affecting all of us right now and in a much more important way than the CCPA, and that's in data transfers and SHREMS. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Renzo to talk about what I know is on everyone's mind, which is what are we gonna do as a result of SHREMS? Uh, thank you, Judy. Um, hello, everyone, and I'm Renzo Marchini. I'm a partner in the privacy team in London. <laughs> um, yes, it's a bit like Groundhog Day with uh, with uh, data transfers as well. Five years ago, Safe Harbor died. This year, Privacy Shield died, and and now up to date with EDPB recommendations. Chloe, if you can move to the next slide. Um, I think most people on the call will know the facts in the background as to how we got to the judgment in July. So very, very, very briefly about what the court said. The court, of course, invalidated the privacy shield. It did so because US surveillance laws were deemed not to be compatible with EU rules, fundamental rights in the charter. Um, 
FISA 702. And thank you, Judy, for telling me how to pronounce it. It's not FISA, it's FISA 702, Executive Order 12333. Um, had too much privacy, had privacy, privacy over the shield. Um, criticisms, of course, of no individual address. It was disproportionate, the powers that the spy agencies have in the US, and there was no sufficient oversight. Of course, I'm, I'm simplifying. The good news ish um, was that standard contractual clauses, um, although scrutinized in that case, survived. They remained a valid transfer mechanism, but only if in their use you ensured an essentially equivalent level of protection to EU rules. And if the laws of a particular destination country are suspect, the court said you must consider what additional measures, supplementary measures you can do, you can put in place to ensure that protection. And if you can't ensure that protection, you must not transfer as a European exporter and European supervisory authorities, um, much I'm sure to their annoyance, are asked to enforce all this. So we move on to the next slide. Since July, we have been waiting with bated breath for the regulators to speak en masse. Um, individual regulators have given individual guidance in immediate aftermath, some in particular in Germany, particularly restrictive. But together, the European Data Protection Board have only now recently pronounced on it with two documents, two recommendations, which are not yet final, but are out for public consultation. So get your comments in, please. Um, the first one, uh, which I'll talk about mostly on the actual supplementary measures that you can put in place in the process you need to go through. But the second one, not to be ignored, um, how to assess the surveillance measures in a destination country to ensure that there is that European essential guarantee, which feeds into step three of the process. So the next slide shows you a six step process that the European Data Protection Board set out for you. Um, step one and step two, um, very simple, and I'll take them together given the uh, lack of time, uh, know your transfers and identify your transfer tool. Um, anyone that's gone through a GDPR process, has a good privacy accountability framework in place, should know where their data is already, should know how the data is protected with standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules or, or whatever it might be. So those two should be easy to leverage, leverage your existing privacy um, steps that you've taken. Um, but step three is the first difficult um, part of the process. Once you know where your data is going, as a controller, you can't just rely on your tool. You can't just rely on your standard contractual clauses that you might have in place or, um, or binding corporate rules. And for those that have those, you must also assess in the context of a particular transfer, in the context of particular data, particular recipient, particular destination country, whether or not those clauses will guarantee that there won't be inappropriate access to the data by foreign law enforcement, foreign governments, foreign spy agencies. It's going to be hard for anyone to undertake that assessment for any country, or certainly the US, and reach a conclusion that it's OK. Um, it's an unenviable task that the European Data Protection Board have placed on data exporters here. And if you put it in the context of when the European Commission um, assesses adequacy to give a country a big tick, they typically take 18 months, 24 months to undertake an adequacy assessment and they often get it wrong. They got it wrong in safe harbour. They thought that was adequate. The court disagreed. They thought that privacy shield was adequate. The court disagreed. But now exporters unfortunately have to go through the process of undertaking this assessment and simply uh, and, and assessing it and documenting it. It's tempting to consider maybe just assuming and that you're going to fail and just moving on to putting in place supplementary measures. Um, but the EDPB um, are being quite clear in it, but you do have to document your risk assessment before you consider what measures to put in place. Um, I'll come to supplementary measures in a moment, which will be the next slide, but when you've considered those, if you can protect the data, um, 
so we are back for thank you very much if you if you can protect the data with good measures then you can move on but if you can't then you mustn't transfer so the you know at the top of the slide there no no measures can and ensure the protection of the data do not transfer um, the procedural step step five is you know it's probably relatively meaningless in the, sta in, in the standard contractual clauses um, arena. There are no procedural steps to take in place if you rely on SECs unamended. And step six of the recommendations is that you must reevaluate at appropriate intervals. So the, the thinking here is, is, is very logical. You know, at the point you undertake your transfer impact assessment and think about what measures to put in place. The laws might say one thing, the technical. Um, you know, tools available to bad actors to circumvent the protections might be a particular state. Those things evolve over time, so you have to keep revisiting. So we move on to the next slide. We'll talk about the uh, most important step, I think, for most businesses, which are what additional measures could be put in place. And the key one that the recommendations set out are technical measures. So, if you can encrypt the data such that if they did get into the hands of a foreign government, the, that government cannot understand the data, it's encrypted to a sufficiently strong degree, um, and have, they have no access to the key. So the key remains in Europe, actually stronger than that, the key remains outside of a group of the company that's got it outside of Europe, the, the encrypted data, then you can probably go ahead. You can go ahead because it will be protected to the correct standard. Similarly with pseudonymization, if the data can be pseudonymized in the hands of the exporter such that the importer cannot actually re-identify the individual, pseudonymous data of course under data, uh, European data protection will remain in personal data, but if the, if the recipient and government agencies getting the data from the recipient cannot be identified then you can go ahead but again the key has to remain in Europe. The guidance then goes on to say that you might be able to rely on contractual measures which are such things as a, a contractual promise on the recipient to challenge access by authorities or uh, to give notice to redirect and, and, and such things or similarly organizational measures, internal policies on, um, uh, on, on fighting particular access requests from certain uh, from, from government agencies. The trouble is with the recommendations it, it lacks a little bit of pragmatism here because they say that it you know, these contractual measures, these organizational measures cannot bind foreign governments, of course they can't. And so in a lot of situations which they set out, which are very common, um, use case six about putting data in the clear in the hands of a foreign cloud service provider, which a lot of SaaS solutions will be like that, data in the clear. They cannot envisage any technical measures which will be sufficient. And they go on to say the contractual measure and organization measures will also be insufficient. So no more transference to the cloud outside of Europe is a logical conclusion from what they say. Um, so they've got a couple of challenging examples like that, and, and it's hard to really see exactly how to navigate this, except to do some sort of risk-based uh, approach, looking at the nature of your data and thinking to yourself, well, governments, foreign governments do not care about this particular data. Um, but again, the re EDPB recommendations um, say you can't do that. You can't look at the possibility that a particular data transfer is not of interest. You cannot look at the historical uh, record of requests made of a particular recipient, which is, um, I, as repeating myself, a little bit impractical and lacks, um, lacks use really for a lot of businesses in, in, in Europe. Um, can we move on to the next slide? And I'll try and sort of sum up this quite complicated area with some key takeaways. First of all, you need to do something. You can't just put your head in the sand, as tempting as that is, or pull the duvet over your head. You need to know where your flows are, and you probably ought to uh, prioritize and 
do what you can reasonably do. Um, data transfers, we know from our clients, are not going to cease here. Um, and a lot of people cannot actually comply with what the European Data Protection Board are asking you to do. But you need to do something and you ought to document your assessments to a certain level, um, at least in terms of your, your key transfers. If you can put technical measures in place, such as encrypting to the right standards, then please do so. Um, and, and that will help sort of defend any challenge. If you're on the customer side, get your vendors to help um, you know, do the documentation, do the paper and with technical solutions, with organizational solutions, do ask for transparency reports and so on. And if you're on the vendor side, then of course you will want your customers to carry on using you and you will want to seek to help them. Uh, lastly, do amend your contracts, do identify some contractual measures that you can put in place and of course that requires repapering uh, but of course that perhaps could be repapered as part of a rollout of the new SECs um, on which note I will hand over to Leone. Thanks very much Renzo. Good afternoon everybody and um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Leonie Parr. I'm also a partner in the London-based Privacy, Security and Information Law team and I'm going to talk to you over the next 10 minutes or so about the future of standard contractual clauses. If you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide please Chloe. So most of you will be aware that we currently have a set of approved standard contractual clauses to be put in place in respect of international transfers from the EU to countries outside the EU that have not been deemed to be adequate from a data protection perspective. And currently there are three approved sets of clauses covering two distinct data processing scenarios. So we've got two sets of controller to controller, approved standard contractual clauses, one from 2001 and one from 2004. The 2004 ones are the ones that tend to be used in practice. And we've got a set of approved controller to processor standard contractual clauses. Um, the new draft standard contractual clauses uh, were released by the EU Commission on the 12th of November. Um, and they effectively amount to one set of SECs, but they cover a number of different data processing scenarios because they're modular in nature. And so they cover the existing scenarios that are captured by the existing sets of approved clauses. So the controller to controller transfers and also the controller to processor transfers. But in quite a welcome development, the modular clauses also now cover processor to sub processor transfers. So there's a, a specific set of clauses now for the circumstances in which, let's say, you have an EU-based controller appointing an EU-based processor who then makes onward transfers of personal data to a sub-processor based outside the EEA. And up to, up to now, we haven't really had any clauses to suit that particular situation. And we've been trying to shoehorn the existing controller to processor clauses to fit that particular arrangement. Um, we also have in the new set of model clauses, um, processor to controller clauses. And that's in specific recognition of the fact that processors will now themselves be subject to direct statutory obligations under the GDPR, particularly in relation to international transfers. So where you have, for example, a non-EEA based controller who may or may not be subject to the GDPR themselves, using an EU-based processor, then inevitably there will be transfers from that processor back to the non-EU, uh, non-EEA controller. And again, up to now, we haven't really had any approved clauses to deal with that particular scenario. And so now we have them in these modular clauses that are currently in draft form. Um, there is a transition period. It's env envisaged that there will be a grace period of 12 months from the date of approval of the SECs to allow businesses to put the new SECs in place. So in other words, if businesses are relying on the current versions of the SECs, they will have 12 months from the date of approval of the new versions to um, put the new versions in place. Um, 
the draft set and the associated decision is currently subject to consultation. Uh, the period of consultation is in fact due to end on Thursday of this week, so the 10th of December, and it's envisaged that the finalised SECs will be in place sometime early in the new year. Okay, next slide please, Chloe. So what are some of the key takeaways? Uh, well, in fact, there's a huge amount to digest from the new sets of clauses, and there are a considerable number of welcome improvements. I've mentioned uh, one of the improvements already was is that the, the new modular clauses cover additional processing scenarios. So processor to sub-processor to scenarios and processor to controller scenarios. They also recognise that, in fact, the data exporter can be based outside the EEA. And in fact, the current approved SECs don't do that. So essentially, if you've got a non-EEA controller that's caught by the GDPR, either by virtue of being established in the EU and processing in data in the context of that establishment under Article 3.1, or by virtue of offering goods and services into the EU, or monitoring the behaviour of individuals in the EU, then Currently, um, there is no approved clauses to cover transfers from that uh, data exporter to another non-EEA uh, data importer. And so again, up to now, we've been using the existing approved clauses and shoehorning them into these types of arrangements to try to cover off uh, compliance as far as possible. So under the new clauses, there's this specific recognition that actually the data exporter can itself be based outside the EEA. Um, it's quite welcome as well that uh, in the context of those processor to controller clauses that I mentioned, they are in fact quite light touch. So if you remember, they're to cover the scenario where you have a non-EEA controller appointing an EU-based processor. And so they cover the transfers of data back from that EU-based processor to the original controller. And as you can imagine in that circumstance, a non-EEA controller who may themselves not even be subject to the GDPR and not have any association with the EU other than the fact that they're using an EU-based processor are not going to expect hugely onerous data protection obligations to be imposed on them. So um, it's a good thing then that these modular clauses take that into consideration and they appear to be quite light touch in nature. There's also a specific recognition that data exporters can rely on uh, third party audit certifications produced by data importers in respect of data protection compliance. And up to now, there's been a lot of confusion about this because under the existing approved clauses, there was a suggestion that data importers would have to submit to some kinds of on site inspections by data exporters to ensure data protection compliance. And of course, in that context, there has been a huge pushback from the large data processors who don't want thousands of customers traipsing through their data data protection facilities. Um, so there's been welcome clarification on that point. And there's also a specific recognition of the fact that data exporters may be subject to local law conflicts. So they might be prohibited from telling data exporters about the fact that they've received a law enforcement request. So it's quite pragmatic that there is a specific recognition of this within the clauses. But there are still, however, some remaining challenges. And uh, one of the key challenges is that these modular clauses um, envisage quite a number of additional commercial data protection terms. Now, many of these have been put in place in order to address the requirements of Article 28 of the GDPR, which requires certain mandatory provisions to be put in place between a controller and a processor. So there's quite a number of additional commercial terms, in particular around liability. So there's a real risk that some of those may conflict with existing arrangements. And of course, they're going to make the repapering exercise much more difficult because they potentially will reopen commercial negotiations. The clauses also, in many cases, in many instances, um, en envisage direct interactions between the ultimate subprocessor and the controller. So if we go back to that example where we have an EU-based controller appointing an EU-based processor who then onward transfers to a non-EEA subprocessor, there's quite a few of exa examples where the, um, the ultimate subprocessor is expected to interact directly with the original controller based in the EU. And again, 
that is largely unrealistic. There's also quite onerous breach reporting requirements for non-EEA-based controllers. It is envisaged that, for example, in the context of a controller-to-controller -controller transfer, the non-EEA controller, who themselves may not even be subject to the GDPR, has breach reporting obligations vis-a-vis -vis the relevant supervisory authority. And again, that is quite onerous. Um, there's also very onerous obligations on data importers regarding government access requests. Um, it's envisaged that they would exhaust all available remedies to challenge that request. So you can imagine that that will potentially involve quite costly legal processes and quite costly legal advice for those data importers. Um, there also is an obligation in a processor to subprocessor context to um, identify the ultimate controllers. So in other words, that uh, the subprocessors would be aware of who all of the ultimate controllers and customers are. So again, back to that example that I've given a few times of your EEA controller, your EEA processor, and an onward transfer to a, a subprocessor, the subprocessor is expected to be able to list all of the customers of the EU-based processor, which again is somewhat unrealistic. And it's envisaged that also, the, um, there would be a controller audit right, uh, that that audit right would be flown down to subprocessors. So in other words, subprocessors would be expected to submit to audits of the ultimate controller, not just of the relevant processor that appoints that subprocessor. So again, not particularly um, pragmatic. Again, this is just a, a whistle-stop tour of some of the, the takeaways. Um, th there's quite a lot to digest, and if you do want any more detail, um, Phil has done a, a really excellent article on uh, the first impressions of the, the draft SECs. And so, for those who haven't seen it, that's available on the Field Fisher blog. And those, for those of you who want some further reading in your spare time, as you're absorbing all this SREM stuff, uh, Field Fisher have also made a submission to the EU Commission um, outlining uh, various issues that we, we've, we've thought that I, ideally could be addressed. And so, on that note, I will hand back to Hazel um, for any Q&A. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Leonie, and thank you um, all speakers for an exciting canter through 2020. There's plenty to keep data protection people busy, I think, into the next year. So unsurprisingly, we do have a few questions and we have a few minutes to, left to tackle these. So I'm going to try to read through the questions in a sensible order and direct them where they need to go. So first of all, Mr. Lee, um, here's, a, here's a question for you. How high do you rate the chances of the UK being given adequacy status? <laughs> <laughs> and I've, uh, I've got a five pound note here that I'm ready to, to place on, <laughs> on the hazard <laughs> I was going to say, I'm just going to root around in my pocket, see if I can find a sort of a 10 pence piece that I can flip and, you know, sort of call heads <laughs> or something. I think the, um, uh, you know, if I had to bet, I would say far more likely than not. Um, and primarily for a couple of reasons. I think one is that adequacy is important, not just for commercial trade, but it's also very important for cooperation in anti-terrorism atoms between sort of Europe and the UK. And so if we want law enforcement cooperation between European agencies and UK agencies, those European agencies need a way to send us that data for, for our input. And adequacy is going to be absolutely vital to enabling that. And I think everybody is in agreement that um, that, that is a very good thing. And so there is a strong incentive to make adequacy happen for that reason. Um, the other element I guess I would point to is that Notwithstanding some of the concerns that Europe might have around things like the UK's Investigatory Powers Act, it's hard to see if you can't give the UK adequacy who you could possibly give adequacy to, given that we have had such close integration with Europe for such a long period of time and that we are wholesale adopting the GDPR into UK law, that we have an independent regulator, we have rights of redress and all those things that Schrems 2 uh, has said we must have. So, uh, you know, for that reason, I think I would place my money on us getting adequacy. The two um, potential challenges are one, although it is not meant to be a politicised process, uh, you have to assume that adequacy is to some degree going to be dependent on 
uh, our success in securing a trade deal. So, you know, wait and see what happens, I think, um, in, in that space. So I guess, you know, that's, I suppose that, that, that would be my view, I, more likely than not, but not a done deal. Thank you. Okay, my next question, I think, is actually for Leone. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, are we yet aware of a timeline for the SCC changes? From a UK perspective, is it worth implementing SCC across our third party networks with changes soon on the horizon? Um, I think it, it wouldn't really make sense to do that until we have the finalized version of the SCCs. Um, I, I don't think we have a date for that yet. Uh, the, what I've seen is that they're expected to be finalized early in 2021. Um, so it would make sense until we have those final versions, um, given that we anticipate that there's likely to be, you know, quite a few submissions to the EU Commission um, on that uh, on those aspects. It will also be worth waiting to see what happens um, from a UK perspective. I mean, it seems unlikely at this stage that there will be, you know, finalised versions of the SECs before the end of the year. If there were finalised versions before the end of the, the year, effectively, they, they would form part of the UK regime, if you like. If they mm -hmm. don't, which is looking increasingly likely to, to be the case, then you would have separate UK SECs um, from those that are ultimately approved by the EU. So again, it, it makes sense to wait and see what, what will happen in that regard. I have seen uh, in various contracts attempts to reference SECs as maybe amended from time to time. Now, you know, it, it's possible that depending on how you've incorporated them and how tied your existing provisions of your clauses are to them um, or try to amend them, that that might help you buy some time if, you know, if you, you know, if you, if you can't implement the new ones within the grace period. Um, but I think you probably will find that it, it ultimately makes sense um, to replace them in due course. Okay, thank you. So I'm just looking at time. We have a few questions that I, I can see we're not going to get to, but there's one that I just want to direct towards Renzo because he's looking far too relaxed and he needs a, a challenging question. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a couple of questions about um, uh, data being sent outside the EU in a clear slash uh, encrypted, unencrypted basis. So um, one of these questions is quite an interesting one that is, given the approach seems to say that data cannot be processed outside of the EU in a clear format, do you see this as a form of EU data localization? Do you see this as anti-competitive? Um, Renzo. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 the logical conclusion of what the European Data Protection mm. Board is saying, that they're saying European data must remain in Europe unless you can make it technically impossible. Um, what does that mean? So, yeah, a great boost for EU data centres. <laughs> um, no, in, in reality, that's, that's not going to happen. Um, I think people will will have to calm down. Yes, it is anti-competitive, and you know we've heard from our German partners, Hazel. You might know um, that you know, there, there are constitutional challenges possible in German law uh, around you know a freedom to operate a business. So it is anti-competitive. It is possibly conflicting even with other fundamental European rights, the, the right to operate a business. Um, it it isn't just meaning that you you must keep data. Uh, you know, in a data center in Europe, it, it almost reaches a logical conclusion of what's the point of having multinational groups anymore? Because what's the point of being in a group which has got non-European companies in it if you can't share endeavors with them? And you can't mm -hmm. because you can't send emails to your colleagues in California <laughs> yeah, and so on. So um, you, you take it to a logical extreme uh, conclusion of what the EDPB are saying, mm -hmm. and it makes no sense. And um, so we really have to wait and see what the regulators end up doing with it when they're, when they're charged with poss possibly enforcing it. OK. Well, that's just too depressing a, a point to end on. So I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to turn to Judy for the, my final question. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, you've got to be cheerful now. Um, give us, give us a, um, I don't song. know, one, no, <laughs> give us a song. Yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> a TV show. No, no, uh, give us a, give us one, two, three actions for the start of 
2021? What would be on your data protection to do list? It doesn't have to be CCPA related, but you know, you and I have been listening to this for the for the last hour. What would be on the to do list for most clients? Do you think? Um, dry your tears and hope that 2021 is better. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I think, you know, before we got on this call, I, I joked with everyone of, you know, who would have who would have predicted a year ago that we'd be on on December 8th and still not know the terms of Brexit and who a year ago would mm -hmm. have predicted the Schrems decision. You know, I, you know, I think that this has just been an unprecedented year in so many respects. You know, we do know, um, you know, while well, I speak with the American accent, we do know that there are changes coming to the CCPA. They're going to incorporate more of these GDPR terms, and that's the form of the CPRA, um, which is um, a ballot-led initiative. And I think the point is this, you know, what led us to Schrems was Schrems himself. What drove the changes to data privacy law in California were privacy activists. And as much as we can all sit around here as data professionals, Professionals and try to look at how we think regulators are going to react. You know, we do have to take into account the fact that the toothpaste is out of the tube and that a lot of the changes that we're seeing and a lot of the things that we are all reacting to and trying to implement are all being being driven by privacy activists and people that do care about their privacy rights. So I don't know um, how we're going to get ourselves out of this, this, this situation that we all seem to find ourselves in, but I don't think that 2021 is going to see the end of privacy activism um, and I don't think it's going to be the end of the challenges that we all face and try and implement those for our, our businesses and our clients. Thank you. I'll get worse before it gets better. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you all for joining and listening to us um, talk about 2020, the year that was. And we will follow up with a recording, a set of slides, and we will also follow up with the questions that we've not managed to answer today. Um, wishing you all the very best for the remainder of this year and the holiday season and looking forward to seeing you at one of our webinars next year. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Bye.